My name is Blaine Butler. I'm a product owner with the Center for Open Science, or COS. COS is a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase openness, integrity, and re reproducibility of research by making open scholarship practices easier and more normative. One of the ways in which COS aims to um, complete this mission is through the creation and maintenance of the Open Science Framework, or OSF. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be a hands-on webinar, so I'll be demoing a lot of things. So um, these are just a few of the images from the document that's been shared in the chat, um, just as an easier way to share, you know, this kind of um, context on a larger screen. Um, and then what I want to really highlight right now is the topics. So there's a lot to the OSF. Um, so we're going to be briefly briefly going over your account and profile, discovering content or OSF search, research planning, registrations and pre-registrations, study management and collaboration or OSF projects, research sharing OSF preprints, and then the relationships that exist amongst all of these things and then from the OSF to other things outside. Um, I could spend an hour talking about each and every one of these things. Um, there's also facets of, in, of within these things that can, we could also focus more time on. Um, so what I'm going to ask from you is after this webinar, we're going to send out a follow-up survey. Please let us know what you would like to learn more about, what you need deeper dives into, maybe things that you've been struggling to do within the OSF or have just more questions about that we can help answer that so that we can provide more informative webinars related specifically to those topics that you're most interested in. Um, as I said, uh, you know, COS is a nonprofit with an organization with a mission to increase openness. And through that, we host the OSF. What is the OSF? It's a free open source online research platform that was designed to support researchers, allowing them to openly, transparently, and collaboratively share their work at all stages of the research life cycle. This involves the search and discovery phase, sharing what you're working on, seeing what others are working on and easily finding that. Designing your study, you can use registrations or pre-registrations to design your study, plan out what you're intending to do. Collecting and analyzing data in a collaborative manner. You can use an OSF project to gather all the data from any collaborators, um, share that data, analyze that data, and then publishing your reports. The OSF has its own preprint service as well as hosting other preprint providers where you can publish your data um, as soon as you're finished with uh, your research study, as well as you can also then share any other outputs from your research, including data, code, questionnaires, any other supplementary information that is important for you to share for others to understand your research process and your research project. So let's get started. We're going to go into the OSF. If you do not have an account, you can easily create an account by just signing up. Feel free to do this now. You can log in if you have an ORC ID here, or you can log in via your institution. Only those institutions that are institutional members um, have the ability to sign on through, a, through your institution. If you do not know that your if your institution is an OSF institutional member, you can easily search that here. Um, I went to James Madison University, so I am going to look up. And if I were still at James Madison, I could then sign on using my James Madison logon. Um, just because I also know. So you can see other universities that are also institutional members, um, but as I am not going to be signing in via a, a university institution right now, I'm just going to sign in with my account. Okay, now I'm signed in. This is my account. Um, the first thing I'm gonna show you real briefly 
is the settings. Um, you can also, we can look at the profile, but this is my information, my name. Um, and then it also has a preview for how your name looks in a citation. So you can make sure that your name is represented how you want to. You can also fill in your social, employment, and other education information. The other thing I think is actually really important it, to know is your account setting. So let's say I'm at you know Center for Open Science or COS now, but let's say you move institutions, you can add an alternate um, email address, and then you would still keep access to your OSF account and all of the content within that, even as you move organizations. Um, there's also, you know, I've connected my org ID, that's here. My affiliated institution right now is Center for Open Science. You can change your password. Um, if you need to deactivate your account, you can you can request to deactivate your account here. Um, and then I'll show you your profile. Um, it just shows any public projects, ORC ID, and then LinkedIn information and any other information you have decided to provide. Um, moving on from account and profile, we're going to start with OSF search. So this is a, a newer function or functionality that we added just last year. Um, so within this, you can refine your results. So let's say I'm interested in projects. And I want to know projects that are funded by the National Institute of Health. I can then see all of the projects, which are the 19, that are funded by the National Institute of Health. Um, mm -hmm. I can then look at the metadata associated with that. And you can see that this one was funded by the National Institute of Health and they were able to provide the award number. Um, and it's a data there, it does contain a data set. So. I can also look at registrations and within registrations, I could pick a subject like psychology and as you can see with registrations, there is the ability to add resources or outputs from the registration, like data, code, materials, any papers, or any supplementary information. So let's say I'm interested in psychology um, registrations that have data. And now I have 230 results. I can then take these results and I can put them, I can share them with somebody else. And if they put in the same URL, they will get the same results refined, um, which is a very nice feature because it allows you to share your search terms. Um, within this, I can also, I can look at autistic. And there are seven registrations related to autistic um, studies that have data. So that is also a very nice feature that you can use to refine what you're looking for and get the data. Um, and all most of these you can see also have code and materials. So it's a very nice feature to be able to kind of look or refine what you're looking for. Since I've been talking about registrations, um, let me go. Actually, um, Blaine, real quick, uh, would we would it be okay if we popped up the poll for folks? Oh, I'm sorry, I totally forgot the poll. <laughs> I'm yeah, I hadn't practiced that as much. Um, yeah, so I forgot. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone already had an OSF account, um, and how familiar you are with the OSF. Thanks, Blaine. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, it's fine. I totally, I hadn't practiced that, but like once. <laughs> Sorry. You can continue to fill out the poll. I'm going to go back to talking about uh, registrations. I am so sorry for that, y'all. Um, okay. So going to registrations. Um. Uh, 
you can see we um, have OSF registries. We also have other registry services. These are branded registries um, that you can uh, you can um, try to have your uh, registration put into. Um, I'm just going to do an add new. Um, for doing a registration, you it asks you if you have content for a registration um, in an existing OSF project. Um, I'm going to say no. Um, and just for ease of use, then there are registration templates that you have available to choose from. If you want more information about the templates that, that is in the document that Mark shared and has been shared in the chat, um, you can look for more information there. Just for time and ease of use, I'm going to select the open-ended registration because it's one of our simplest registrations. Um, create a draft. You will then need to fill out all of the metadata fields, title, description, um, any contributors, the license, subjects, tags. Then you provide a summary and you can add files to your registration. And then you would hit review. As, as there is nothing in this registration, it's not going to allow me to actually register it. Um, but if all of this information is filled out, you can then register it. Um, one of the really nice things about registrations is that you have the ability to update them. I can show you a sample. Um, I have a, this is on one of our test servers. I have a, a registration and it was created on March 14th. And that would be the original. There's also an update from March 14th. And then the latest, which was updated on the 15th. And all of that information is included along with any of the updates that are in the registration. So um, why are registrations and pre-registrations important? Uh, pre-registration is a time-stamped read-only version of the research plan created and submitted to a public registry before the study is conducted. Um, Pre-registrations are a formal, transparent story of your study. The study describes what your research plan to do. Any updates, which I just showed, can be shown that needed to be made during the study, and then any results. Um, those are the data resources that we look for and search for earlier, such as uh, data, code, papers, materials, or any other supplementary information, such as like questionnaires you used. Um, if you're doing a psychology study where you're talking to um, interviewing, you know, subjects, um, think of a registration as a study management plan that you would use to, that would accompany your data management plan. Uh, there's a link that describes differences between registrations and pre-registrations in more detail. But essentially, a pre-registration is what you would complete before you begin any um, data collection or data review and a registration can be done a little bit later into your research process. Okay, now that we've gone through registries, I'm going to go. Now we're gonna talk about OSF projects. So if you wanna create a new project, you can then select your affiliation as my affiliation is only with Center for Open Science. I can select it, I can also remove it. Um, and then you have your storage location. So we have um, multiple storage locations. These were essential for making sure that data management requirements by country and like globally are addressed. Um, we have Australia, Canada, Germany, which is based essentially the um, European data storage um, location in the United States. And this ensures that whatever data require, data management, data storage requirements are needed um, by different countries are addressed by selecting whichever uh, location either your funder or your institution has required for you. Um, 
the European Union Germany location is what is essentially used by all of the European Union and is also used by those in the UK. I'm going to just select the US and then create my project. I'm going to then go to my project. And all projects initially created are private. You can make them public at any time. You can then go back to make, I could make this public. And then I can go back. And make it private again. And just as a note, when you make it public, you can create a DOI for it. Um, but I'm going to go back and make it private again. And you can change this, like I said, at any time. Um, some other nice things about projects is you have the ability to add files. So there are a couple of different ways to add files. You can take a file on your desktop and just drag it and drop it. You can also go to your files page. You can drag and drop here. And I'm just uploading a bunch of different types of files. One's a PDF. This is a WAV file. Um, it is the Star Wars theme. You can also add a file by uploading. And data set. Once you've added your files, you can then go in. And this is a very, very brief <laughs> discussion about your metadata abilities within the OSF, but you can then edit your, um, your file metadata. So this would be, you can put in a description resource type. I'm going to say data set and then language. You can also see that there's project metadata. Um, that is going to be editable from your project overview page. So you can um, edit your description, contributors, resource type, any funding support information. Um, like you have your funder, you have a grant number, you have a link to the grant, um, your affiliated institutions, um, the dates created and modified are all going to be populated. And then I have not put any tags in, but I could add tags describing what the content is within um, my project. Another nice feature, um, you can see a wiki here. So there is a, a wiki associated with each project. And that shows up, I can then go back in and edit that. And if I go back to the wiki, you can see each version of that wiki is saved and time stamped. Um, this is a nice way to uh, communicate with others that are working on your within your project with you, your collaborators, um, informing them of updates. You can add, you can link images, you can put links to videos, uh, audio files, all within your wiki. Um, as I mentioned, collaborators, I'll also show you um, adding contributors. So if you want to add another person to your research project or your OSF project. You can simply go in and search. I'm going to pick one of my colleagues. Um, I see an Eric Olson associated with the Center for Open Science. Um, if you're still unsure if this is the person you think they are because there is another Eric Olson, you can click on their name and it'll take you to their user profile page. Um, a nice way to verify is to look at their ORC ID if they've linked that. 
And I can see that this is Eric Olson, who's at the Center for Open Science. Um, he also, you know, this is his ORC ID information. So I'm like, this is, this is him. So now I go back and I select to add him. And I add him as an admin. Um, permissions are also gone into detail in the document. Um, administrators, there's read, write, and read permissions. You have the ability to change. If, if you create the project, you're an, automatically an admin, and you have the ability to um, associate permissions with any contributors that you add. So I'm going to add another. And any contributor that you add will get an email notification that they've been added to a project. Um, and so now I can see that I'm on the project, Eric's on the project, and Daniel's on the project. Um, if I look at the contributors, these are the permissions. Are they bibliographic contributors? You can change these permissions at any time. Um, if I decide that I don't want Eric to have admin permissions anymore, I can downgrade him to a read or read write only, um, just as as you're allowed to control all of the permissions and privacy within your project as you so desire. Um, there's also the ability to add components. So let's say you decide that you want to have your project um, design or split up into individual experiments, or if you want to collect maybe based on all of your data in one component, all of your analysis in another, and then any results or outputs in a, in a third component. Um, the, the ability to add components is, is unlimited and how you want to structure your project is up to you. For now, I'm just gonna pretend that we're doing experiments. Um, store our components can have different storage locations. So let's say you have a collaborator who's in the UK and needs to put their data specifically into a uh, UK storage location or a European Union storage location. They have the ability to do that. Um, you can also add contributors from the original project. They will keep the same permissions as with the original project. You can also add any tags. So if you're tagging this based on, you know, what kind of research you're doing or any other identifiers that are important for you to help, you know, make your research more discoverable, you can carry those over to the component. Uh, I'm just going to create this now. So, um, as you can see that this project or this component is private, that's what the little lock is. I can then, when I make this public, I can either make choose to make the entire project public or I like so make all, or I can just choose to make the main project public and keep experiment one private until I am ready to share the information or data or content within that component. So now just test is going to be public. So if I copy this, and put this here. Anybody, oh, I can log out too. You don't have to be logged in. Anybody in the public can see this, but they will not see that private component. Um, and they'll see the files associated with that test project. Um, you should be able to see this project, but not anything else associated with it. Okay. Another nice feature of um, OSF projects is the ability to have add-ons associated. Um, we have a bunch of different add-ons. So these are external uh, pieces of software that you can link to your project. So let's say you have collaborators at an institution that use 
we'll look at storage first. But use a different storage provider. Um, you know, they may have Box or an Amazon S3 account, Dropbox. Um, you can link your GitHub or GitLab uh, accounts as well. I'm going to do Google Drive just because that's the one uh, we use the most. Um, so in order to enable that, um, this gives you all of the uh, legal ease, um, permissions, what it means, uh, and how you can do things. I'm going to confirm that. Okay, so now it's added and I need to configure that add-on. And so I've already linked my add-on in my profile. Um, there's more information for that in the document that's provided, but I can just import that account from my profile. Um, and so one thing I recommend and that we can and that you can do is within my, I can either link my entire Google Drive, which I don't necessarily want to do, but you can create a folder very specific related to the project that you can just share that folder. So on a project that I've worked on before with the um, Center for Open Science, I created an S3 test photo, test um, file. I'm going to link that. And then if I go back to the project overview, I now see that I have my Google Drive linked and all of these documents in my storage, in my OSF storage. I can then um, move these around. Oops, I didn't mean to open them. And if I move this here, this will now show up in my Google Drive. Um, and that will now be permanently in my Google Drive um, outside of the OSF project. And vice versa. So if I want to move this JPEG to the OSF storage, that is now in OSF storage. And I can access, and it's it's now within the OSF storage and has been removed from my Google Drive. Okay, so um, now we see that I have a, a PDF file, and let's pretend that that PDF file contains the preprint or article from the research that I have done, and I want to publish that as a preprint. So I'm going to go to OSF preprints. Um, so I can submit a preprint. And as I mentioned, OSF preprints is one of the preprint services, but we also host a whole variety of other preprint providers, um, such as Law Archive, uh, Sci Archive, Social Archive, Meta Archive. I'm not going to read them all to you, but these are just a few. Um, and each preprint provider has its own policies regarding moderation. I'm just going to go ahead and use OSF preprints for right now, just for demo purposes. So I can either upload the file directly from my computer. Let's say that I don't have a project, but since I am doing this from a project perspective, I'm going to select. I'm going to do. Okay. Well, for now, I'm just going to then go back. Upload from my computer. Usually that works. I don't know if it's because I'm um, sharing screen and my internet is not good. So I'm just going to drag and drop.
There it goes. Sorry, I think I think my Wi-Fi is a little slow right now. Um, once you've uploaded the file, there are other assertions, um, other information that you need to put in. You can always update or edit your preprint. All of that information is included in the document that's been shared. Um, let's say your preprint gets accepted into a peer review journal. You can put in that DOI here. Um, you can license your preprint according to whatever um, licenses you're comfortable with. Some preprint providers have required licenses um, that you will have to select. I believe for uh, OSF preprints, it's either a universal or a CC by international. Those are, you will then need to put in your abstract. You can select discipline, um, any other authors as of now, my name is the only author, but I can add just as we did with the project, I can add Add another um, author to this. Like I said, I think my internet's a little slow right now. Um, any conflict of interest information that you need to provide, any supplemental materials, you can connect a project here, create a new project if you're going to put your supplemental materials into the new project to be a part of, to be accessible with the um, preprint itself. I am not gonna submit this. Um, because it's not an actual preprint. So I'm going to cancel that. Yes. Um, so going back to our document, so now we've, you know, we've talked about DOIs, we've talked about ORC IDs, um, and now this is how the OSF is personal identifier ready. Um, we link you know, your research organization registry to your ORC ID to DOIs, and then that is um, kind of carried throughout, kind of like a little kick in your suitcase with you with all of the um, PIDs that you have created and keeping them all together. Um, your ORC ID, if you link it to your OSF account, will automatically be updated with any preprints or projects that you create on the OSF. Um, and then any or IDs that you associate to any of those things will continue to log into your institution. Um, okay, so need any help, have any more questions? This is how we, how we always end. These links, this is taken directly from the very end of the document. Um, if you have any video references, video references um, a link to our OSF Support Center, some tips and tricks, tips and tricks that we share on a monthly basis, um, kind of just either new features or interesting ways to utilize the OSF. Uh, you can always reach out to our support desk directly via support at osf.io. Um, product team members will help you. Um, we will also be starting um, OSF, or we will be starting uh, office hours that you can sign up for next month. Um, this is a link to any other webinars and events that we have. Um, if you are interested or you're part of an organization or an institution that wants to have um, an institutional membership, you can click this link and reach out to us and we can help you um, discuss what other tools that are available through the OSF and which one might be best for you. Um, please don't hesitate to send us any questions, any features you think um, would be helpful for using the OSF. Um, as you know, we went through with some of the add-ons, we're working to expand the number of third-party pieces of software that we uh, link to. Um, so looking at like a data management plan tools, um, potentially expanding um, to electronic lab notebooks, other things like that. Let us know what you need because our job is to provide for you um, the best possible product in the OSF open science framework that we had that meets the needs of your organization and how you're doing your research. Okay, I'm gonna stop share. Sorry, that was a little bit fast. I'm a fast talker, um, but we have a couple of minutes or at least 10 minutes <laughs> for any questions, if anyone has any. Or have they all been answered already? There is one question that we have, which is, I'm not sure 
Uh, we had someone to ask, what is the difference between a registration and a preprint? Mark, do you want to take that? You're the, I'm, you're the, you're the registration expert. Sure, I'll be happy to. So a pre-registration is essentially a plan of what you intend to do. It happens even before a study even begins. A preprint is essentially a manuscript right before you are published. So it's after your study is completed. So they're kind of like two sides, almost the same coin. It's just on whether or not it was before the study or after the study. And then we have another question that was um, in the chat, which is, is there a place in each project or data set to put institutional generated unique IDs? Their institution is generating their own IDs for each funded project. I'm not sure if that will be a Blaine question or potentially a Gretchen question. Gretchen, can you answer that? Is that in our metadata map? Uh, additional identifiers. Uh, so, um, right. Uh, are, assuming these are identifiers that like your institution is assigning to a work, so a, a unique, an identifier that's unique within your institution and not an identifier for the institution. And if that's the case, please write in and, and correct me on that. Um, right now, there is not a place to put additional identifiers. However, um, there will very soon um, be ability to add new, some additional metadata fields in, in additional templates. Um, and there will be room in those for additional identifiers. Um, so keep an eye on the um, Center for Open Science blog and our announcements will be announcing about those um, new metadata templates that are available. And one of those templates is going to be uh, supplemental um, standard metadata uh, according to the data site metadata schema. Um, so it will have the ability for additional identifiers, additional types of descriptions like table of contents, um, additional kinds of related identifiers, um, you know, things that are cited, things that are things that support that are, you know, elsewhere um, and uh, additional dates for, you know, date something was created versus accepted versus published, etc. Um, and perhaps a few others I can't remember right now, but keep an eye on the COS um, announcements and blog and, and we'll be putting more information out about that. Okay, are there any other questions that we look into? And like, I wanna say, you know, remember we could have gone like it, it was very brief and, and it was an overview of everything. Um, make sure you answer our, you know, our follow-up uh, uh, email about what you want more information about, and we can make sure to do a deeper dive into that in the coming months. And we'll be posting the schedule um, on that events page, our webinars and events page. Um, we're going to be doing another OSF 101 next month, and then the month after that, we're going to start incorporating some of the deeper dives into the other areas, like the search, registrations, pre-registrations, projects. Um, metadata, if that's of interest, um, a lot of, like I said, there's a lot there and trying to give an overview of everything, but at the same time, um, allow for more feedback from you so that we can make sure to give you the information that you need for any pain points you have, any questions that come up all the time. And as I mentioned, you can always email support at OSF and we can get those information or get you answers that are specific and we'll be starting to host um, our office hours where you can sign up for some time to talk with a product owner or COS staff member about very specific questions that you might have that we can schedule one-on-one -on -one time to help you with. So look out for that, keep an eye on our events and webinars page and we'll be putting those things out there. All right, we have a couple more questions. Okay, Amen. I, can't, I don't know where my chat is or the Q and A. It's okay. Um, so how permanent and reliable is OSF? Is it a good idea to maintain everything that is happening in a research group from lab books to published works on OSF? We do have a lot of um, OSF re or research labs that have started out over a decade ago, um, putting their research lab on, and there are templates for this too, in the document that was shared, um, there are templates for like creating, you know, starting your research lab on the OSF. Um, I've seen in that structure can be how you want. There's a lot of like onboarding data sets. Um, 
however you want to structure your lab group, but there are templates there for others that have done that. Um, we can do, you can look for other research labs. There's some really good ones that have, uh, especially that use their wiki specifically for onboarding new research lab members um, and communicating and sharing data sets and keeping all of that in one place. It's, it's really, uh, having been, having worked in a research lab, it's really nice to have everything in a digital findable format. Um, paper lab notebooks and going back through those is very hard. Um, so then be having all of that data centralized. And if, and if you have it so that your institution doesn't want you to put it on OSF, um, storage, then you can just link to your institutional research, you know, data storage and have that available through your OSF project so that everyone has access to any of those data sets generated, um, uh, you know, by users or by lab members two years ago. Um, so that when they leave, it's not kept on their computer and then hard to find later, it's connected to a project so that everybody has access to it and can find it after they have progressed through the group um, or finished off their you know, portion of the research project. That's a very long answer to a very short question. Our next question is, would you recommend to have a single project for a bigger grant project and have them set up as single studies as components? Or would you recommend having each smaller study as a separate project? That's going to be on a very case-by-case -case basis. I think it depends upon how you're on that research grant funding, how you're collaborating. Um, if you want to set it up so that you have co collaborators with components so that they can kind of choose when they're ready to share their data publicly. Um, you may also have instances where um, you're doing research for um, indigenous groups where there's a lot of privacy issues. And so until that data is de-identified, you aren't uh, will to share it, or there might be specific licensing issues for different pieces of the research. Um, so having a component that could potentially have, you know, more, more secure access uh, allowed with it, um, or who has access to it um, is, is a nice way to be able to kind of define that. Um, so that's, I think it's, I guess it's a very case by case basis. Is there, if there's anyone else who wants to comment on that, um, feel free to jump in. I think that's, that was exactly it. Depends on the lab, depends on the discipline, depends on the structure. Yeah. And on the funder, the funder may want everything in one, like, you know, working with them too, and making sure that whatever their requirements are for data sharing um, and ac accessibility are met. Um, so it's, you know, and your institution, like all of, <laughs> it's a whole balancing act about how your open scholarship or open science practices need to be carried out. It requires input from a lot of different stakeholders. All right. And we have another question. Does OSF allow open peer reviewing? We are not set up for open peer reviewing. There is, and I can share screen again real quick. I didn't hit the share, sorry. I always do that. So there is the ability to allow comments, but that's not always peer reviewing. Um, but that is a way that you can allow for others to, um, to comment on your work. And you could, get rid of this now, but I'll put the chat over here. So like you can put into, your wiki, like, feel free to, you know, re comment on. Oh no, I can't load it. Oh, here it is. Okay, so I could put into my wiki. Please comment on my protocol. So that is that is one way we can enable it. We are. Um, there are future plans to um, allow for more communication within the OSF itself. Um, so if you want to kind of set up more, you know, 
not necessarily like a Slack, but like more communication within the OSF. Um, but that's a future improvement that we're working on. Thank you. Um, and if if they stop using OSF, is all the data they have deleted or removed? No, your data, unless you request that um, you do a GDPR delete and request all of your content and information be removed, you can stop using the OSF and the projects will remain. And the registrations are permanent and permanent with, with a DOI. So they will remain forever um, unless they are withdrawn. Um, and then with, for withdrawals, each registry, each branded registry or registry service has its own um, determinations for what is allowed to be withdrawn. And even if they're withdrawn, there is a, um, a metadata kind of like left behind for withdrawn registrations. It gives basics, even though most of the information is removed. I guess tombstone page um, for the registrations that have been withdrawn. And we had another question just came in. Um, did they understand that registration is done for a complete projects, meaning they can't pre-register a review protocol, but can't register it? I don't think I understood that question. Oh, are you talking about scoping reviews? Uh, a re pre-register review protocol. Mark, do you know the answer to that one? Yeah, I'm not sure if I... You can pre-register a review protocol. It's more from the fact of you're trying to say exactly, here's what I'm going to review, here's how I'm going to review it in my process. And if you're going from that approach before we even start anything, um, then you can pre-register it. Even if you want to do a small sample and just say, like, here is a sample just to make sure that my analysis and my code is working appropriately, you can pre-register that and then pre-register a second one saying, now that I've done the analysis, Here's everything I want to do, or you can clean it, or you can include it all within one regist pre registration. It's totally up to you. The main point is to want to be transparent and to try to do it before you start it, data collection. All right, we had another question come in. What is the difference between registering a systematic review and a systematic review protocol in OSF? I don't know, Crystal, this might be a you question. Um, I'm actually not sure I understand the question. So if the difference between pre-registering a systematic review and a systematic review protocol in OSF, I actually, yeah, I don't know that I understand the question. Are they, at, um, maybe Robol, you can, um, uh, type out like, do you, are you asking about the difference between pre-registering on OSF and on a different platform? Do they need to review the protocol first? So I guess it depends on what you mean by um, protocol. So pre-registration is where you're basically telling everybody what your plan is for doing a, um, in this case, like a systematic review. So um, that would include your protocol. Um, and so you are creating a plan and you are, uploading that onto the OSF or another platform of your choice. It doesn't have to be the OSF. Um, and then that is that is a record of what you plan on doing in the study. And then on the OSF, at least you can update it. And if there are changes, um, you just need to make sure that you justify those changes. Um, and so um, I think it sounds like based on my understanding of the question is they're they're both the same. But I may not. I may not be understanding the question. I'll put my email in the um, in the chat in case somebody wants to follow up with me on that. Thank you, Crystal. All right, and, and, and I did drop two example labs into the chat: um, the Ali Lab and the Alley Lab. Um, the Alley Lab's been on the OSF since 2018, and the Wiley Lab has been on, and they, they both have different, slightly different structures for how they set up their lab group or their lab page. Um, so, 
Thank you. And we have a question for Gretchen. Are the FAIR principles incorporated in OSF? So for example, having to use a controlled vocabulary for data sets uploaded, such as the Darwin Core for biodiversity data. Gretchen? Um, yeah, so, uh, so FAIR is a, a pretty broad um, guideline. Uh, so we do uh, actively work to um, increase findability for the F, accessibility, interoperability, reusability with lots of aspects of our platform and our metadata. Um, with the specific example you gave about um, using a controlled vocabulary for data sets, um, at the moment, that is not a feature. Um, of OSF to actually control um, the vocabulary or the template that you're using for the metadata. However, related to um, the new development I was just talking about, um, keep an eye out on our COS blog and announcements. Um, some of, We are going to be releasing a, a new feature that will allow for the use of specific customized um, metadata templates. Right now, Darwin Core is not one of the ones um, that's supported, but it is actually on a list of ones that we're considering. Um, and we'll be um, happy to have feedback about ones that we should add after that. So I think right now you could not um, specifically in a platform specified way use a controlled vocabulary like that. You could certainly add Darwin Core terms as tags or in your description. Um, and they would be a little more, you know, kind of free form, um, but so searchable. Um, but in the future, we will be supporting more very specific metadata schema like that. Thank you. Okay, we have another question, which is, how can I get a DOI for my supplementary materials on OSF? And Crystal, I think you are answering that one. Do you want to go ahead and go off mute? Yeah, I was just going to say, if you have a, a project and you make the project public, you can generate a DOI. Um, it'll be up at the top uh, near where the, the title and everything is, the description and where you uh, where Blaine was showing where you can select a license. So once your project is public, you can create a DOI for it. Easy enough. All right, give it another minute. We have four minutes left to see if there are any other questions. Yes, Neil put in there, you can also get DOIs for individual components. So let's say you wanted to put all of your data into a component and create a DOI just for the data. You can do that as well. Thank you, Neil. Yep. Is it possible to add resources or components with an existing DOI to a project? For example, a published paper? I know you can add this to a registration. Is it possible to link them to a project as well? I'm not sure. Eric, are you here? Or Daniel? Uh, no, that isn't it, not in the in the metadata. There isn't a way to associate a uh, a paper publication to a project. Um, you have opportunities to to still post those in your in your wiki or uh, elsewhere in the project, but the uh, resources that the registrations have are not on projects currently. I'll add though that you will be able to with the new metadata template um, add those um, as you know uh, related items. Um, but they won't be as Eric said, they won't be the same as the badges that are in the registration. Yep. So as you guys can see, there is a, a lot of work going towards keeping things fair, using DOIs, making things, everything permanent and visible. And we're always looking for feedback to improve those services. So if you have any ideas, suggestions, recommendations, or pain points, feel free to reach out to me or to Daniel Steger, who is our technical community manager. And I'll put both of our emails in the chat here in a moment. All right, Blaine, we have two minutes. Anything else you'd like to say to wrap up? No, other than please make sure you fill out the um, the follow-up survey just so that we know. Like I, I've seen a lot of questions about registrations and pre-registrations. Um, so, you know, like I know, like I said, make sure you give us your feedback on what you want to hear more about. And we are going to make sure that we address those in future um, webinars and events that we're holding to give you more information. And as Mark mentioned, you know, he gave your uh, his and Daniel's emails, but also feel free 
if you just want to write into support and say, I need help with this, or I think it would be great if the OSF did this. Um, we take all of those requests and that feedback into our plans for how we're going to make our platform better. Um, it's a very, you know, we, we try to be as user centric as possible in picking what future improvements we're going to do that are going to be, give you the ones using the product the best um, the the best experience that we possibly can, and that's a it, and as you can see from how we've answered these questions, it's a team effort, and we all work together to try to give you what you need to do the research that you want to do on our platform. Um, thank you for joining us, and thank you for being so engaging. It's always great to see all of these questions, um, and have you know have y'all answering each other's questions in the chat. Um, knowing that, you know, there's a fair amount of you I saw from the poll that are actually already have OSF accounts um, and feel fairly familiar with the OSF. And like I said, this is just an intro, but then yes, let us know and we can dive deeper into the subjects that you are most interested in getting more information about or that you struggle with. So thank you again. Have a great rest of the week.